Hello, hello, and welcome back to Bumblebee. Prepare for all levels of daring, stupid, and brave as we're about to count down the top 10 impossible prison escapes you never knew about. Our first up really showed two times a charm, even if you do get caught in the end. And famous robber Redon Fod escaped from a French prison where he was incarcerated for the 2010 death of a police officer. On July 1st, 2018, he escaped like an apparent cartoon supervillain. Masterminding the help of armed, masked men who took a helicopter pilot hostage, forced him to land in the prison yard and use the power tools to break through the prison doors and hustle Fad to freedom. He had the men set off smoke canisters to hide them from prison video cameras and landed the helicopter in the only part of the property not protected by anti-helicopter netting. It was connected that after this escape that maybe some sus drone seen flying over the prison months earlier had been involved in planning the escape, which was over within minutes. His escape sparked a massive manhunt that involved about 2,900 police officers and soldiers. He then tried to elude police by disguising himself as a woman in a burqa before he was arrested in October of 2018. The helicopter escape wasn't the first time Fayed had made a dramatic escape from prison, however. In 2013, while detained and awaiting trial for a different 2010 robbery, 2010 was a bad year for Fayed, he blasted his way out of another French prison, having hidden a device in a box of tissues, only after taking four guards and one inmate hostage and destroying five doors to get himself to freedom. He then fled in a getaway car which he afterwards set fire to and disappeared, obviously to be recaptured and later escape prison again. Next up is Catch Me If You Can, quite literally, as Frank Abagnale Jr. inspired the movie. He also managed to escape in his greatest con ever after being sentenced to 12 years in prison in 1971. So it starts with a governmental screw up, naturally, as all beautiful things do, and this one came in the form of the prison marshal in charge of transport for getting detention papers. No biggie nowadays, but that was essentially essentially any and all proof that he was in prison, not something else, in the first place. Knowing this, he decided to convince the prison guards that he was an undercover prison inspector, which he did easily being educated and well spoken. He then came up with the idea to have his friend Jean pose as an undercover journalist doing an article on prisons. So she managed to get a hold of a prison inspector's card and makes a forgery and doctored an FBI agent card and then slipped both to Frank when visiting him. When the time came, he flipped flashed the false ID at the guards and asked to speak to the FBI agent on the card. The guards then believe him, rang the number given to them, and it was answered by Jean. She claimed that she needed to speak to him right away outside of the prison, and the guards simply let him go. While Frank's story was famously chronicled to Hollywood fanfare, some believe and publicly speculate that it's too unsubstantiated to hold up to scrutiny. However, others maintain that entities like the Federation Detention Center would prefer to have their slip-ups considered to be hoaxes rather than admit to their own incompetence. You've got mail next, and it's damp gross. And it's because Richard Lee Minclair wasn't your traditional prison escapist. On the contrary, he used a kind of ingenious and unorthodox method to regain his freedom and managed to mail himself out of jail. Richard is robbing a grain storage facility in Minos, North Dakota on November 17th of 1987 when two men startle him in the process and he opened fire on the pair, one of whom died from their wounds. McNair was convicted of first degree and attempted, earning him two life sentences and 30 years for burglary. Clawing at the walls of North Dakota State Penitentiary, he manages to escape through a ventilation pipe in 1992, but would be recaptured in 93. But man did good old Richard get a taste for escape. After building a makeshift compartment complete with a breathing tube and fitting himself inside a mailbag on April 5th of 2006, Richard placed himself beside a mailbag pile that was taken to a nearby warehouse with a forklift outside the prison in Pollock, Louisiana. The heat was unbelievable, he said. The inside of the pod felt like the furnace sweat rolled off me, my head was swimming in the fog, and I was afraid I would pass out. It was a tight fit. I couldn't wipe the sweat from my brow, it was running into my eyes, down my neck, dripping from the tip of my nose, and everywhere else. Once the warehouse staff left for lunch, McNair bolted and crawled out like a sweaty, slick baby from the mailbox womb. He's later caught running down a nearby railroad track by a police officer, but he convinces the cop he wasn't the prison escapee authorities had been notified about. He remains at large until late 2007 when he's arrested for 
for driving a stolen vehicle. This Parisian is a dramatic diva of an escape artist. It's pretentious Pascal. And how pretentious is Pascal, you may wonder? He planned his most recent prison break via helicopter to be on Bastille Day, the French holiday commemorating the storming of a prison. Pascal Payette has managed to escape from two maximum security prisons in France, each time using a hijacked helicopter. On a third occasion, he helped three other inmates escape using his signature helicopter tactic. His first escape took place in 2001 from a French prison and his second escape took place in 2007 from a prison in Ingrasse. By July of 2007, Payette was one of the most closely surveilled prisoners in France and was never kept at the same prison for more than six months. He had officially been classified a prisoner under especially high surveillance and placed in solitary confinement. Despite these measures, on July 14, 2007, taking advantage of Bastille Day celebrations, four masked men hijack a helicopter and use it to free Payette from his solitary confinement. Within two months, he was locked back up and from then on, his location kept a secret due to the connected nature of his escapes. Get your homie that'll steal a helicopter and then come through for you guys. Like Rapunzel, this guy also used a braid to escape a tower. It's a dental floss descent. In 1994, Robert Dale Shepard was being held at the South Central Regional Jail in South Charleston, West Virginia. Here, he managed to braid a rope made from dental floss and climbed his way to freedom. Two days before his escape, Robert braided a dental floss into a rope and tried unsuccessfully to thread it through a fence in the recreation yard. He couldn't get enough of it and left. So when it was found by guards, he thought he was done for, but he wasn't. So June 29th, he makes a successful break for it using the same floss braid method. The rope had the thickness of a telephone cord and helped him climb down the 18 foot cylinder block walls before he used a hacksaw to cut through the fence. He says that the floss rope sliced his hands up an extreme amount though. Shepard planned the escape for days, bought 200 yard packs of floss from the prison commissary and traded cigarettes for more floss from unsuspecting inmates. His rope took seven packs altogether. Shepard enjoyed 41 days of freedom living mainly in the woods eating berries and bathing in creeks like a bear before he was recaptured after robbing a pharmacy near his original hometown. His name may be otherwise, but they call him the Korean Houdini. He's a criminal and yoga expert who managed to escape police custody twice using his master ability of body manipulation. In September of 2012, 53 year old Choi Gapok coated his upper body in lotion and escaped from his cell in a Korean prison by squeezing through the food slot at the bottom of the cell. He snuck past three prison officers on duty who had fallen asleep and slipped out a narrow window. The food slot alone was 15 centimeters tall and 45 centimeters wide, meaning it's not even one by one feet. Police who reviewed the CCTV after the escape said the prisoner managed to squeeze out of the food slot in under a minute by moving with the flexibility of an octopus. Choi is known to be the head of a theft ring and previously escaped from prison custody while on a convoy bus carrying prisoners to jail 22 years ago. At that time, he slipped through iron bars and caging the bus and was reapprehended two days later. To delay the guards from realizing he had disappeared, Gapok had arranged his pillows under the blanket to make it look as if he was still sleeping, just like the way he had seen done in the movie Shawshank Redemption. What a copycat poser, get your own escape ideas. He was caught six days after his escape. John Dillinger may be the king of this list as a career escapee. He spent 1933 to 34 committing a variety of violent robberies and a couple jail breaks. But May 10th of 1933, when Dillinger was paroled after being in prison for eight and a half years, really marked the beginning of his infamy. According to the FBI, Dillinger robbed a bank almost immediately upon release. When arrested, police found escape plans already on John, who denied any knowledge of any planned escapes. Right. Dummies believed him, and several days later, a group of eight of Dillinger's friends used those same plans to break him out of Indiana. Indiana State Prison. The men told the guards that they were there to move Dillinger to the prison because he had broken his parole. When the sheriff asked them for their credentials, the group went into action, killing the sheriff, beating the rest of the guards, and busting Dillinger out of jail. Dillinger and his gang went on to a crime spree, looting two police arsenals and then robbing banks, until the gang went to Arizona to hide out, where they were caught and again jailed. What followed was one of the most daring prison breaks in history. Lake County Jail was considered to be escape proof, which seemed like a good idea considering Dillinger's earlier jailbreaks. Nonetheless, on March 3rd, 1934, John Dillinger escapes after bluffing 33 jailers and inmates with a mock hand pew pew carved of blackened wood right in his cell. Arts and crafts pay off kids. He and his co-conspirators locked up everyone in various cells, closets, and living quarters, stole two real weapons from the warden's quarters, and climbed
climbed over a wall. Once they're outside the wall, the two men commandeered the sheriff's private car, taking deputy sheriff and garage worker along as hostages, and rode right through the 50 man cordon whose sole purpose was to make sure he stayed inside. He gave the signal to leave by singing out, Get along, little doggy, go along. Two hours after their escape, Dillinger and his companion released the two hostages they'd taken, giving them each a handshake, a cigarette, and four dollars for the cab fare back to the prison. The two desperados were free thanks to a fake wooden prop. And even though the two escapees avoided a court on a manhunt, it ultimately did lead to John Dillinger's death. And speaking of, let's hear about this arts and crafts escape. At Parkhurst Prison, one of the most legendary prison escapes to ever occur happened in 1995, showing off true ingenuity and creativity. Three prisoners, Andrew Roger, one of the most feared men in Parkhurst, Matthew Williams, who was regarded as the nutty professor figure in the jail, and Rose, who was diligent, quiet, and also a trained pilot, managed to make a 25 foot steel ladder as well as a pew pew in the prison's metal shop where guards and other people are. They just whipped out an unsuspicious ladder and weapon. They were able to craft a skeleton key for the prison just from photographic memory too, which is absolutely insane. The men each took turns staring it down I guess until they could compare it and build one correctly the three could agree on. In short, the three prisoners were able to essentially walk out of prison using the key they made and scaling the walls with the ladder. They were captured four days later after their escape before they could get on a plane and fly to freedom while piloted by Keith Rose. If the men had gone straight for the ferry, they would have actually been able to leave the island. They should have just built one since they're such Bob the Builder dudes, but living in pompous and prim conditions compared to these other inmates, let's call these next guys spoiled brat escapees. David Sweat and Richard Matt, two prisoners at the more moderate Clinton Correctional Facility, spent months planning their escape. Both inmates worked in the privileged sections of the prison, including the kitchen, which gave them access to tools. When they walked around the prison field, the duo realized that the speed bump in the field was actually a pipe they could potentially be crawling through to escape. Like any good escape story, some dimwit gets pulled into the mix. Richard Matt establishes a relationship with the prison tailor, Joyce Mitchell, and convinced her to sneak in hacksaw blades hidden in frozen hamburger meat. These resources and light prison security allowed them to have the necessary tools and time to cut through the steel walls. They left dummies with facility sweaters in their beds to fool the guards during their nightly checks, and they also reportedly left a note that said, have a nice day. Great dudes. Originally, Joyce was supposed to meet them outside the prison walls and further aid their escape with a getaway vehicle, however, she failed to turn up and the pair had to continue on their way. After several days on the run from officials, the two were eventually located and a standoff resulted in Sweat being wounded and captured and Matt being killed. Meanwhile, Joyce Mitchell pleaded guilty to her involvement in the escape and was sentenced to a maximum of 7 years in prison. She is serving her time in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women and has been denied parole twice so far. The married 51 year old told that she enjoyed the attention, the feeling that both of them gave me, but that she only had a physical relationship with Matt. And last but not least is the story of I Love You Philip Morris. Not many know that this Jim Carrey movie is based off of a real story, but con man Stephen J. Russell lands himself in jail for fraud and meets the love of his life, Philip Morris, who is set to be released soon after they meet. Well, prison walls weren't going to separate him from the man of his dreams, and Russell would go on to escape from prison on four different occasions to be with Morris. To walk out of jail successfully, once Russell made a guard's uniform. He made a doctor's uniform uniform for another successful attempt, and once got a hold of a cell phone to convince a court clerk to lower his bail. Russell's last successful escape from maximum security prison, however, was as insane as it was brilliant. He used a crash diet and in a supply of laxative to simulate the rapid weight loss associated with a full blown case of AIDS. He then arranged a transfer to a minimum security prison hospital, followed by a transfer to hospice care, where he once again just walked out the front door. Not once did it occur to anyone to actually run tests on Russell to determine if he actually had AIDS because of, well, homophobia. While free, Russell sent a fake death certificate to the Texas courthouse, making him legally dead. Suspicious of the chain of events, police familiar with Russell thought everything was a little too convenient and they began tracking Morris. When Morris and Russell reunited in Florida, by law this story is crazy so it needs to have some connection to Florida, Russell was arrested and his original sentence was extended to 144 years. His maximum sentence date is March 13th of 2113, but on February 7th of 2023, Russell was finally granted parole. Alright, here we are at the end of our countdown. I hope you enjoyed. Remember to like and subscribe if you want to keep up with Bumblebee's regular content, and comment down below if you think you'd be capable of a jailbreak.